possible, two possible ways of doing that. One would be that he would make the agreement with all of us collectively. So that, as it were, there's one covenant between him and everybody, collectively. Um, well, Hobbes says that can't work because there's no way for all of us collectively to make an agreement unless what? Unless there's someone who's acting in our name for all of us that we are the authors of. And if there's someone acting in our name who's able to transfer our right of nature for us to someone else to make a covenant, uh, well, and some of the acting that we all are authors of, what do we already have? We already have a sovereign. So the only way for us collectively to act together to make this would-be agreement with the would-be sovereign is if we already have a sovereign. Someone who is reducing the plurality of our voices to one, who can act in all of our name. Okay, so this won't work. There's no way to have this would-be sovereign make a covenant with all of us collectively unless we already have a sovereign to act in our name. Can sovereign transfer his right nature to another sovereign? I think, he, I think Hobbes would say that a sovereign can do that, but in fact would not. Uh, would not accept it under a certain circumstance that we'll still talk about later. In order to get like a universal sovereign, you could just give your right to someone else. Yes, so, so this is possible. But I, I should say it this way. Yes, I think Hobbes would say it is possible, and we will talk in a minute about the conditions under which he thinks it would be rational. What, would, what do you think the conditions under which you think it would be rational? Mm, uh, I don't know. Uh, I already questioned in Hobbes one about blockchain marketing and all that. He says that the monarch would be able to Okay, so, so, so certainly that's one way. Right? So, so certainly that's one way. Yeah. If you get concrete? Yeah, if you get right. right. So that's one way to do it. So this would be an example of sovereignty by acquisition. So we'll talk about that later. Okay, so this was the first possibility. Making an agreement with us collectively won't work unless we already have a sovereign. You can't get a sovereign in the first place doing that. The obvious other thing would be then to imagine the sovereign, the be sovereign, making an agreement with each of us individually. Okay, so um, sovereign can't be part of the contract, can't make an agreement with the collective without already having a sovereign. Okay, and the other possibility, Hobbes says, can't make an agreement with each individual either. So why not? So this is what he's saying at the bottom of um, one eleven. He says, besides, if any one or more of them, the individuals that make this contract with the sovereign, if any one or more of them pretend a breach of the covenant made by the sovereign at his institution, and others, or one, uh, or one other of his subjects, or even himself alone, pretend or claim that there was no such breach, then there is, in this case, no judge to decide the controversy. It returns, therefore, to the sword again, mere physical strength. And every man recovereth the, the right of protecting himself by his own strength, contrary to the, to the design they had in the institution. It's therefore, he says, in vain to grant sovereignty by way of precedent covenant. So, Hobbes' thought here is that if we make, if we force the sovereign to make a covenant with each of us individually, well, we could do that. But that covenant is not going to be binding. That, that covenant is not going to get the sovereign to do anything differently than he would have done otherwise. Because this is an unenforceable agreement. Imagine that this agreement between the sovereign and you 
require the sovereign to do a certain thing, give up a certain right. And now you claim that the sovereign has violated that agreement. Well, who's going to judge whether there has been a violation or not? There are two possibilities. One is the sovereign himself is going to judge whether he's violated the covenant. In which case, he will judge that he has not, and that will be the end of it. So if the sovereign is going to be the judge of whether the sovereign has violated the covenant, there's not going to be anything binding him at all. The other possibility, though, is that maybe, well, there, I guess there are two other possibilities. One is that somebody else would be the judge of whether the sovereign has violated the covenant. And in which case, what? That person is the sovereign, not the one we thought of. And there's one other possibility. Maybe you get to decide whether the sovereign has violated the covenant he made with you. What about that possibility? Yeah. What if there's multiple sovereigns, though? Can't be multiple sovereigns. There's going to be one individual ultimately responsible for making these judgments. If we have multiple, I mean, think about this one. In the state of nature, we have multiple sovereigns, each of us. That's, that's not a good situation. And it's, it's not a good situation because there's no way of resolving the conflicting judgments of each one. There's no way of resolving the conflicting judgments of the sovereigns. Where they, we, would be in a state of divorce bill. Okay, and that's the answer also to my question from a moment ago. If each of us is deciding for ourselves whether the would-be sovereign has violated the covenant, each of us has retained what? Our right, our right of nature. We're still judging for ourselves rather than having relinquished our judgment to the sovereign. And we actually, maybe despite appearances, are still in the state of nature. If each individual is judging for himself whether the covenant has been violated, we're still in the state of nature. We don't actually have a sovereign. We don't actually have a sovereign. So we can't actually get a sovereign in this way. So uh, we can't make an agreement with, sorry, the sovereign, would-be sovereign, can't make an agreement with each individual because there would be no one to judge the violations he himself did. Or we'd actually be in the state of nature still. So in this case, we may actually get a sovereign, but he won't be bound by anything. In this case, uh, we wouldn't actually get a sovereign. So we can't get a sovereign, he says, through this kind of um, contract. OK, and so then, um, so the implication of this that we've seen already, actually, um, and that is that the rights of the sovereign are such that nothing he can do would be either an injury to his subjects or be unjust. Uh, obvious that we talked about the fact that nothing the sovereign can do can be unjust because he still has his full right of nature and he has all of our rights of nature. He hasn't been bound by the covenant. What about injury? Hobbes uh, says we can't, the sovereign, if, if we have a genuine sovereign, he can't injure subjects. And this is the technical word, injury, as opposed to perhaps damage. Yeah, well, I was going to say, it's not because uh, injury is <coughs> pretty much just find his blame, and blame involves a value judgment, and we don't have the right to judge who feels. Um, so right, so, so that's right. Injury has to do with blame and responsibility. But I think we can say who's responsible. So if the sovereign does damage to me, uh, does, does some kind of harm to me, who's responsible? Who's I'm responsible. I'm the author 
of what the sovereign does, what the sovereign causes to, to be acted upon. All of us are collectively responsible. All of us are individually responsible for what the sovereign uh, causes to be done. So we're the authors of whatever he judges or causes to happen. That's just because you made that decision you picked him. But that's that's right. That's because, because we transferred our right of nature to him. That's right. And then, but that's very controversial for me. If you pick him, you were the author to pick him. But then, at the same time, you're not the author. You're not in charge of his actions. If it's a person who is the subject. That, well, you're not in charge of them. You're responsible for them. Yeah. So just as if I give you power of attorney to sign checks, on my bank account, I'm responsible for what you have done. Even if I, in that case, even if I don't like what you've done, what you've done. Okay, um, I'm going to skip ahead to. Um, what Hobbes says about that. So. Um, Yeah, so um, Hobbes understands that this is um, kind of an extreme view. <coughs> that we have either all or nothing with the sovereign. Either we give up our right of nature and our right to judge for ourselves what's valuable, take uh, authority and responsibility for what the sovereign causes to be done, or we don't actually have a commonwealth and we're still in a state of nature. This people, Hobbes is aware, people like their liberty. They're going to be unwilling to give it up. But this is the only way to get out of the state of nature, he says. So this is what he's saying on page 117, paragraph 20. He says, but a man may here object that the condition of subject in a commonwealth with an absolute monarch or ruler the condition of subjects is very miserable as being obnoxious to the lusts and other irregular passions of him or them that have so unlimited power in their hands. And commonly, they that live under a monarch think it's the fault of monarchy, and they that live under the government of democracy or other sovereign assembly attribute all the inconveniences to that form of commonwealth, not considering that when in fact the estate of man can never be without some incommodity or other, and that the greatest that in any form of government can possibly happen to the people in general is scarce sensible in respect of the miseries and horrible calamities that accompany a civil war. The state of man, as bad as you think the commonwealth might be living under an absolute monarch, as bad as, um, as, bad as it actually is, uh, for Hobbes, um, it's not going to be as bad as the only alternative, which is the state of nature, which is the state of nature. Those are the only two choices. You may not fully like living in a commonwealth with an absolute sovereign. Hobbes understands that, but what choice do you have? I guess I should emphasize uh, here also um, that these rights are, of sovereignty are indivisible. So that the sovereign, I'm going to skip over this, but the sovereign uh, makes laws, applies the law in particular cases, enforces the law. So the source of uh, law, the application of law, the enforcement of law, all reside in the sovereign. So no divided government. 